Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Tania Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 864. The Council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at each departmental hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website, boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony was on April 26 at 6 p.m. and the next one on June 2nd at 6 p.m. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtually via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation and residence and limit your comments to two minutes and ensure that all comments and concerns are can be heard. Email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Submit a two minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the city council budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on docket 0480 to 0482, orders for the FY operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for the other post and for other post employment benefits OPEB. Dockets 0483 orders for the capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket, dockets 0484 to 0486 orders for the capital budget including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be youth engagement and employment, YEE. Our panelists for today's hearing are Rashad Cope, Director, Jeremy Kazan, I'm sorry, Kazanjian, is that how you say it, Armory? Thank you. Manager of Engagement and Outreach, YEE. Jose Maso, Ch uh, Chief of Human Services. Thank you. And I am joined today by our colleagues, Councilor President Ed Flynn, District 2, Councilor Aaron Murphy at large, Councilor Kendra Lara, District 6, Councilor Kenzie Bach, District 8. Um, I will now turn over to uh, the administration for their presentation. Before we do that, just so you know, you have about 15 minutes for your presentation, and then we'll go to round one, which is eight minutes, um, approximately about eight minutes for each counselor, and then to public testimony. I will um, ask that you respond since we're a small group, and um, the youth had to come all the way here to testify. I will ask that you respond to the youth that are present in the chamber and you can reserve uh, responses um, by email, um, anything virtual. Um, hopefully, you, hope, hopefully you find that fair. Um, and I would ask that public testimony is not a back and forth, that if uh, the youth or anyone else here in person to testify that it's a question, and then I'll ask them to um, move their seats and then you're responding. So please take notes with the questions so you can respond. 
Um, and then we'll do second round and then just final comments or, or statements and we'll wrap up. Without further ado, you have the floor for your presentation. Great. Um, you want to start off? Um, no, not at all. Questions? Um, great, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much. Um, and first and foremost, hello to all of the members of the City Council um, that is present here today. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you for just your tireless efforts um, and really continuing to to be stark advocates for, for equity and opportunities and also just addressing issues that matter most to our constituents um, and also just elevating the voices and the concerns and ideas of our constituents as well. Um, I think we, we here in our office, we, uh, we often say that we truly believe that the most critical entry point of impact in a person's life is during their youth years. Um, and we appreciate not only just your commitment um, to Boston youth, but Mayor Wu's commitment as well, um, and really ensuring all members of our community that have a stake um, in the success of young people are included. <clears throat> um, really, as we, as a city, just make decisions that are in the best interest um, of our young people. So just want to say thank you for having us here today to present our fiscal year 23 budget. Um, to really further advance the incredibly important work um, here in the city of Boston. Uh, my name is Rashad Cope. I'm the director of the Department of Youth Engagement and Employment. Um, I'm joined by Chief Masso um, of the Human Service Cabinet, um, and also Jeremy Kazandran Amory, um, who supports our engagement outreach work. Um, Jeremy will be available um, to answer any questions um, that arise during our session today. Um, we did not prepare um, slides for today, um, as we have not in past hearings, um, though that, that is a method that we absolutely will consider um, for future budget hearing sessions. Um, so, um, Council, for the next 15 minutes or so, I'll just give a, a, a high-level walkthrough of just the work of our department over the past year, and also provide um, an understanding of the goals the initiatives and the priorities um, for this upcoming fiscal year as well. Um, this will be a brief synops synopsis of the RFI that you have received um, in your council packet. Um, so I'll, I'll jump right in. I, I would first like to just share the mission and vision um, just of our department, which is incredibly important um, as access to opportunities for Boston's youth. Uh, it is a top priority for the city of Boston. Um, and our focus is to ensure that all young people have timely access to workforce development and employment opportunities that really help inform early career and educational choices um, and also have early access to resources and learning experiences that really develop the knowledge and the skills necessary to be engaged in the community through civic leadership and enrichment. So our, our collective mission and vision is this, is that we exist to employ, develop, and engage Boston's youth. Um, and we do this by amplifying youth voice and bridging opportunities for personal and professional growth. Um, our department, we operate in three primary areas. That is youth employment, um, youth workforce and career readiness, and youth engagement and outreach and civic engagement. Um, and I would say we are pleased with the level of success we've experienced in fiscal year 22. While our public health situation has remained unpredictable throughout the year, uh, we did see many of our programs, initiatives, and services gradually return back to in-person um, while remaining flexible with hybrid options. Um, so here are just some of the notable um, highlights and accomplishments from this past year. Um, starting with our youth employment program, um, the Mayor's Youth Jobs Program, it is a collective effort across major youth job intermediaries, um, which consists of ABCD, Boston Pick, John Hancock MLK Scholars, YOU, um, and our DYU SuccessLink team. Um, the goal across the intermediaries um, has been to connect 8,000 plus City of Boston youth ages 14 to 24 with a summer job opportunity that will provide soft skill development, work readiness, and leadership experiences. Um, as our city continues to learn how to live with COVID-19, our partners have remained resilient 
and adapting the youth job experiences to meet the skill development, social and educational needs of our young people. Um, our office, we manage the City of Boston funded SuccessLink school year and summer jobs program. Um, this program provides nearly 5,000 um, employment opportunities annually uh, with a notable increase for this past year, this upcoming year. Um, and you know, our priority is to partner with the local nonprofits, community-based organizations, and city agencies um, who are responsible for providing meaningful employment opportunities in many different fields, um, which is community organizing, STEM, government, education, um, and arts, just to name a few. Um, with our summer 2021 program, um, we hired 3,345 youth and young adults. Um, we partnered with 173 nonprofits um, as partners. Um, and there were two ways this past summer organizations were able to partner with us. One was through our SuccessLink direct partnership um, in which we as a department provide selected organizations with an allocated number of youth positions and we hold the responsibility internally for managing and administering the hiring and the payroll process for youth. Um, the second way organizations were able to partner with us um, is through a SuccessLink grant partnership. Um, in which uh, we provide selected organizations with an allocated number of positions and the wages for the youth employees are funded through a grant and the partner organizations then hold the administrative responsibility for managing the recruitment, the hiring, and the payroll process for youth employees. Um, the grant partnership for summer 2021 was a new initiative that we piloted um, with the goal of really strengthening the youth jobs program um, in an effort to decentralize the process and really improve the efficiency. Um, through that success in grant partnership, we awarded 2.2 million um, in funding to 36 nonprofit organizations um, who manage that administrative process. Um, so that was truly um, an incredible experience for us. Um, many of the organizations that participated as grant partners did provide positive feedback about the pilot, uh, and they've expressed some um, interest and hope that the grant initiative would continue as a standard part of the Successing Employment Program, um, and that it is. Um, so I wanted to share that about our summer program. Um, this current school year program um, for the 2021-2022 year we hired 1,180 um, youth and young adults. Um, this is a 28% increase over the 2020, 2021 school year program, which we hired nine, 938 young people. Um, and that was the largest number of school year jobs our office has ever provided up until this year. Um, and we partnered with 135 nonprofit community-based organizations for the current school year program as well. Um, and I think one great thing about the current school year program is we were able to extend um, the program for an additional two weeks for those organizations and um, young people who had the capacity to um, manage a two-week extension. Um, so I wanted to highlight that. And then the last piece with our youth employment um, is that we have continued to ensure that we're fo we focused on creating equitable access to opportunities for Boston's young people. And we have continued to partner with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement um, to fund the Dreamers Fellowship, uh, which has been an initiative to connect um, immig immigrant youth um, to skill development and leadership development opportunities. Um, this current spring is the fourth season um, that we've been able to work alongside the Moya team um, to provide funding to support the DREAMERS Fellowship Program. Um, so pretty excited about that. Um, the next area is our youth workforce and career readiness um, in which um, you know, we equip and prepare youth to succeed in Boston's workforce really by providing the career development services um, by way of workshops, mentoring, skill building activities. Um, we've administered executive function workshop sessions um, this past year to over 600 young people, which were workshops and conversations that help young people define the hard skills versus soft skills and better understand and develop skills around mental flexibility, 
goal setting, and also time management. Um, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, we administer the YouthWorks um, program, which focuses on providing skill development to proven rich youth um, using the state of Massachusetts YouthWorks Signal Success Curriculum. Um, this program itself, we were able to engage 372 eligible youth in this state-funded program. Um, so this program was really administered um, you know, to provide career readiness and skill development around expanding initiative, professionalism, evaluation, communication, and collaboration. Um, and then the third area of our work um, is our youth engagement and outreach and civic engagement. Um, this area of our work um, manages our Mayor's Youth Council, our Youth Lead the Change, our constituent services, and communications for the department. Um, the Mayor's Youth Council, um, it is in place to really connect, engage, and empower Boston's diverse youth through government and civic participation. Um, the Council provides um, really a space and an opportunity for Boston's youth to serve as ambassadors, um, to represent their schools, their neighborhoods, and their peers. Um, NYC has and continues to be open um, to any high school aged youth who wants to become involved in civic engagement. Um, this past year, we engaged and connected 83 high school students to serve as Mayor's Youth Council ambassadors. Uh, the NYC members served across eight committees and three neighborhood working groups. Um, those committees um, were intended to be mirrored after some of the city departments. Um, bless you. Um, here, um, Arts and Culture, YLC, Workforce and Economic Development, Public Peace, um, Public Health, Education, Civic Engagement, and Climate Action. Um, and then a new part of the Mayor's Youth Council this year were the neighborhood um, working groups um, in which young people uh, were able to serve across three neighborhood working groups. Um, group one um, consisted of Fenway, South End, Back Bay, South Boston, Charlestown, East Boston, Austin Brighton, Beacon Hill, Kenmore, Chinatown in the Financial District, um, Group 2 um, comprised of Roxbury and Dorchester, and Group 3 was High Park, Mattapan, Rosendale, West Roxbury, and Jamaica Plain. Um, another initiative under our civic engagement work um, is our Youth Leads a Change work, um, which is, um, some may know, is the City of Boston's Youth Participatory Budgeting Initiative, um, which empowers young people to manage $1 million of the city's capital budget. Um, where youth across Boston are invited to submit ideas, develop project proposals, vote on projects, um, and also have a role in funding winning projects. Um, this current year, um, we are, have administered um, the YOC process where over 320 ideas were collected by youth across Boston to inform capital projects. Um, there are six projects that were vetted in partnership with city departments for feasibility that will go on the Youth Lead the Change um, ballot for Vote, Vote Fest, which is happening over the next several weeks. Um, and those projects are addressing youth homelessness, heated bus stops with charging, growing Little Sagon, community center digital boards, skate parks, and basketball court redesign. Um, and the, the, the last initiative under our youth engagement outreach work is our MBTA Youth Pass program, um, which is an important service to provide access to affordable transit. Um, and really just, you know, given the economic impact that young adults have experienced, um, this MBTA Youth Pass program, it provides eligible youth with access to transit through a reduced um, cost MBTA pass. Um, this year, we have seen 3,891 active MBTA Youth Pass users, um, you know, which definitely is an increase over the number of users that we've experienced and have seen over the last year. Um, so those are just some notable highlights, um, you know, just of the three different areas of our work. Um, you know, two other, you know, incredible initiatives that um, is worthy to share with our group here today um, that we are incredibly um, happy about um, is one, um, our neighborhood 
pop-up events, uh, which were considered job fairs, um, to engage and recruit young people to connect them to the summer employment program. Um, we hosted four neighborhood job fairs to connect youth to our summer 2022 youth job opportunities. Um, those job fairs um, took place in four neighborhoods, um, the Roxbury and the Mission Hill area um, at the Tobin Community Center, um, Jamaica Plain at Curtis Hall Community Center, and Mattapan at Mildred Ave Community Center, um, and Dorchester as well. Um, so I will, um, I think that was my timer. Um, so I'll wrap up by just um, sharing just quickly, um, just giving thanks to the folks that work in our office um, you know, our team, uh, which consists of young professionals, um, you know, they, they work incredibly hard um, to make the summer and school year um, happen within our office. Um, just want to thank them for their continued dedication um, and their tireless efforts, um, you know, in support of our department. Um, so I'll stop there. All right. Thank you. Um, I actually have a letter I just got a letter from uh, Councilor Mejia, um, and I'll just read it into record. Um, Dear Madam Chair and members of the Ways and Means, I am writing to inform you of my absence during today's City Council hearing on docket 04802486 FY23 Budget Youth Engagement and Employment. A representative for my staff will be listening in and following up with me. I look forward to reviewing the footage and follow up as need be. As you know, the issues affecting our city's young people are some of my top priorities. So while I regret that I am not able to join, I am submitting the following questions to be entered into the record with the hopes of getting a response from the administration either during or after the hearing. Um, I will now read her questions and um, if you can answer them on record and then we'll go on to the next person. Um, last year, our office fought for the secured and security total of $800,000 in funding for youth jobs for young people aged 19 to 24. With $300,000 coming from the operating budget and the remaining $500,000 from our city's ARPA funds. What is the status of this job program? How many youth, how many young people in this age group were employed as a result of this funding and how much money were they paid on average? How much of this fund was used to cover administrative costs, either as a percentage or of total dollar amount? Do we have any plans to increase this funding and or shift this funding away from ARPA and direct it more towards the operating budget? Great, um, thank you for that question, um, Council Mejia, um, in your absence. Um, so that funding um, is ARPA funding, as you mentioned, uh, which um, is meant to fund the Young Adult Workforce Development Grant um, You know that was really aimed at assisting local organizations to um, really create more equitable opportunities by strengthening the workforce and training development opportunities for underrepresented youth. Um, that funding, um, ha that program has not started as of yet uh, within our department, um, primarily because it is a new grant funding initiative um, that our office has not had the capacity to fully administer. Um, you know, and I think one of the major reasons there is over this past year, our office um, did experience um, significant staffing turnover, um, which we, we have a full-time active staffing team this past year of nine full-time employees, um, and we saw five full-time employees transition out of the department, uh, which we know is, um, you know, just transitions have been felt all across the nation, you know, and the city. Um, and our office has, you know, experienced that as well. Um, so that grant funding initiative um, is an initiative that is still a priority. Um, it's important for our office, um, and we're currently in the process of hiring a grants and budget manager um, whose sole responsibility um, will be to administer that grant um, upon other um, grants that our office focuses on as well. Do you now have capacity to 
use the money? So we, we're currently hiring. So we're filling the five vacancies um, that we've experienced this past year. Um, so um, I can give you guys a, you know, an update on where we're at with, with each of those positions. Um, and then we are um, currently in the you process. You mentioned the grant manager will manage the grant, but what about actually using the money, like hiring someone to either coordinate this, these youth jobs or the program or use the money, period? Yeah, it's, a, it's intended to be a grant that we're providing to nonprofit organizations. So oh, it's, it's really, it's, so that funding is meant to, um, to grant out to nonprofit organizations. In RFPs or? Correct. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and then you would need that grant manager in order to disperse and manage the whole, oversee the process. To oversee the, the yes, oversee the entire initiative. So that specific position, where are you in the process? So that position, um, we're currently working with OHR Comp and Class to submit um, that position through um, PRC. Um, so it was approved by OHR Comp and Class. The next step is to submit that position to PRC for PRC approval. What's PRC? Um, it is the Personnel Review Committee for the City of Boston. So it's, it's a process through OHR. Thank you. Yep. I don't, I'm not familiar with these acronyms. I'm new. Um, what if, okay, next question, you ready? Okay. Um, what are we doing to ensure that the young people hired through the YEE funding are receiving a livable wage? Do we know, I, okay, I finished the question, but I think that she's under the impression that you would be hiring people, um, not that there are RFPs. But um, do we know of the housing situations of the young people we hire through this funding? Are we doing, what are we doing to ensure that these young people are being, are able to access stable housing as a result of this program? Um, I understand, thank you. I, I know that one, they're not hired yet and two, they wouldn't be directly hired. So, it, yeah, thank you. Did you want to make a comment about that, though? Yeah, so those terms um, are terms that will be outlined in the RFP for the organizations that will receive the funding. Yeah, thank <coughs> yeah. you. It seems like DYEE is experiencing a lot of staff turnover. What are the reasons for this, and what support does DYEE need to hire new staff and retain them? Yeah, so I, I would say, and as I was mentioning, um, you know, I think the great resignation has, um, you know, really not just impacted our department, um, but also just impacted the city in general. Um, we have seen staff transition, um, you know, for, you know, competitive salary reasons. Um, we've had a staff, um, you know, transition and relocate back to New York. Um, we've had a staff transition because of the city um, vaccine mandate. Um, you know, and workload. So th those are some of the reasons um, that staff have transitioned just this year alone. Thank you. What are we doing to engage youth people? I mean, young people, sorry. I have my glasses are not updated. Uh, young people who primarily speak languages other than English in, rega in regards to employment opportunities. Uh, sure. So I'll um, I'll turn over to Jeremy, um, who's been managing our engagement outreach, to kind of talk about just our partnership with LCA and just some of the other engagement efforts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. So we have been working with Language and Community Access to ensure that the engagements out of the flyers are translated into the major languages of the city, and then in continuing to engage with all of our nonprofit partners, community-based organizations, as well as community centers and libraries to provide, um, upon request, any translated flyers that they would like. Um, and then in addition, making sure that all of our external facing communications, um, including support for applications and such, um, details the process in which people can reach out if they need translation support um, in engaging in any of our processes. Thank you. Um, so we'll turn over to the our first round, um, but just quickly, for those of you who are here to testify, um, you, sh you should um, sign up on a sheet that should be on that area there if you, if you do want to give a testimony today. Um, and we'll go in the order of uh, Council Flynn, then Council Murphy, then Council Lauer, then Councilor Bach. Uh, Councilor President Council Flynn, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel for the work you're doing. My comment or question is about kind of kind of following up on Council Mejia's comment. Um, I know people are turning over throughout city government, state government, in in, in the business community for, for various reasons, better pay or or a different experience. I always think that the most important part of this the year for the city is the summertime. That's when our kids are out of school and we have to be fully engaged helping our kids, whether it's programs, it's sports, or it's food access, some of the issues you highlighted. How do we know, and again, I know it's, I know it's every area of the city and I know it's every, every part of the country too, but, but how do we know that we're focused on making sure that we provide our youth with every opportunity we can and that we're not going to have a staff um, shortage at that time during the summer when we desperately need city workers focused on helping kids and not um, and not interviewing people for jobs during the summer. So can you talk to me about how, how we're going to address that and no, no services will be impacted for our youth? Uh, sure thing, Councillor. Um, so it has been, you know, the priority of our office to make sure that we are um, maintaining the level of services um, that we have provided over um, the last number of years uh, with um, a huge emphasis on our youth employment program. Um, so, you know, we, we've continued to make sure that the engagement, um, you know, that has happened over the last year in terms of connecting young people to employment opportunities um, is a priority. Um, and, you know, our team has worked incredibly hard to make sure that we do, we, we've launched our, our Success Link Summer Jobs Program. Um, there have not been any delays with launching um, the program. There have not been any delays in recruiting partners. We have about 183 organizations um, that are, you know, partners that are signed on to partner with us this summer. Um, the youth application is currently open citywide. Um, young people are currently registering for summer jobs. Um, so, you know, we've, we've ensured that our, you know, the staffing challenges um, are not impacting the current initiatives um, that is a priority of the department. Okay, that's good to hear. Thank you. Appreciate that. And, you know, if there's something that us as a body, the city council can do to be helpful to you and your outreach and your team, please let us know because I know myself and my colleagues would be glad to help in any way possible. So um, just stay in contact with us. Um, so what is the, what is your philosophy in terms of kids getting jobs, which I, which I support, youth employment, which I, which I support, what type of skills do you hope that they are able to um, achieve following this, this employment opportunity? Um, you know, I'm glad they're getting a paycheck. I'm glad it, it builds responsibility and helps their family. But what other skills are you, do you think the, our youth are going to um, acquire during this period? Uh, sh sure, I can jump in, and then if um, you know, if, if Jeremy or Chief Masso want to jump in here as well. Um, so the employment program it's really intended to ensure young people are exploring um, counselor just various um, career opportunities um, and helping young people uh, begin to think about you know careers that they um, would ultimately be interested in. Um, so the skills that young people are developing, um, you know, it's really centered around you know organization, time management. Um, it's learning how to network um, with adults um, that's going to prepare them, you know, for future career opportunities. Um, it's preparing, you know, developing proposals, I mean, portfolios, um, you know, that will, you know, aid in the ability to be competitive um, for job opportunities. Um, and it's giving young people an opportunity to explore um, just various um, career fields. Um, so I would say it's multifaceted in terms of just the skills. It's not just a job. Young people are learning um, and really figuring out, you know, uh, things that they want to be interested in or uh, would be interested in pursuing in the future. Are you providing any assistance 
in terms of helping young people um, on financial literacy, helping them talk to them about a checkbook, talk to them about banking, how to save, how to save funds for school. Are you, are you teaching them any of those types of skills? Yep, sure thing. Um, the, so financial education um, is a part of the workforce and career readiness, um, you know, part of our program. Um, we, we have def one partnership with um, the Mayor's Office of Financial Empowerment, um, you know, who has provided some resources to share with young people um, around financial education. Um, two, we've partnered for, this will be upcoming the fourth year, um, that we're partnering with EverFi, which is a online financial literacy um, module um, in which young people um, you know, can navigate through modules that will teach them everything from savings to credit um, and really just thinking about you know, just planning for their financial future. So um, you know, yes, there is a focus on financial education. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I have no uh, further questions. Just want to say thank you to the panel for the important work you're doing in the city. Thank you, um, President Flynn. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. And thank you for your presentation and all you do for our youth in the city. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for connecting and making those relationships that we know are so important with our youth and young adults. Your work, we know, makes such a positive impact in the lives of our children and their families and their siblings and you know, extended families. Um, and I believe, like I know you do in your mission, that we owe it to our children to, def to fund departments like yours and make sure that you're not needing once in a lifetime opera funds or hoping a grant comes through that we're really making sure that we're putting this into our budget and really valuing and funding it properly. And as a teacher for over two, two decades and as a mom for 32 years, I definitely know how important it is that we support that age group. I was um, a teacher of little kids, but always have a soft spot for that 14 through 24 year um, age group where it can get scary, it can get confusing. They're not sure what path they want to go down. And I know the teachers in their lives, community center workers, our you know, nonprofits, coaches and all, really help keep them on a positive track, hopefully. So worrying, um, wondering if, um, you know, I know that my own children definitely ben benefited from SuccessLink. It was the employment opportunities, the activities, and also the resources. Um, you mentioned Council of Flynn financial literacy. My son took um, several financial literacy courses at um, the community center in our neighborhood and um, jobs opportunities also and learned how to write resumes and look at different options for um, job opportunities across the city. And I definitely believe that it helped them, and I know it helps all of the youth that you work with to become you know, well-adjusted, healthy adults, which we all want for our communities. One thing I do know and we talk a lot about is are we making sure the curriculum in our schools is aligned to the skills our students need to um, get jobs when they're graduating, or in this case, while they're still in high school. Are there any skills or educational gaps that you see our children are missing? And what can we do to help maybe change the curriculum at B BPS or offer some additional training or workforce development so that the kids are prepared for these jobs you're offering? And then the other question was, we know that you know the shutdown from COVID-19 hit our youth and young adults very hard. Many children who were struggling probably before are struggling even more now. And remote learning um, and not having those connections for that extended period of time. So um, worrying about you know, how many kids had fallen through the cracks. Do you have a sense in that age group that, that maybe never went back to school or aren't at our centers anymore? And do you have a shift in numbers? Do you have a sense that we really need to do a different approach to outreach to kids that maybe we've kind of fallen off the grid for us and are there any supports we can do here on the council to help support that? Uh, sure thing, Council. Thank you for both of those questions. Um, 
I think um, first, um, in terms of just curriculum alignment with Boston Public Schools, um, I do think that that is, um, you know, a conversation um, that, you know, requires just further exploration. Um, you know, we definitely see about 65% of our success linked youth um, that are employed um, come from Boston Public Schools, um, you know, but I, you know, there, there has not been, you know, the intentionality around just understanding BPS, you know, workforce readiness curriculum and, and kind of what that looks like within BPS schools and how that aligns with the work that is happening within our department. So I would say definitely with the, you know, support of Chief Nasso, you know, um, and, you know, new leadership, um, that is a conversation um, that we are absolutely just open to um, exploring. Um, and then in terms of just data around, you know, just young people, you know, not being connected to school and resources. So unfortunately, that is not, again, data that we collect. Um, you know, so I, um, unfortunately, that's not something that um, we're privy to and mm -hmm. would be able to, um, you know, share at this moment. Okay. Thank you. That's all right now. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Uh, Councilor Bach? No, Councilor Lauder, sorry. Councilor Lauder, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you so much to the administration for being here today, and to all of my colleagues for being so incredibly patient while Zaire is here in the chamber with us. Uh, hey, are you going to ask questions of Mama? Zaire is, first and foremost, a very goofy kid, which is why he continues to <laughs> giggle at every second, uh, but he's also autistic, and so some of the noises that you hear him, he's trying to get his sensory stimulation in. So. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about um, how you calculated the cost of the 6,000 jobs? And so Mayor Wu has made a commitment to 6,000 summer jobs and 1,500 year round. Can you tell me a little bit about how you calculated that? Some of the numbers based on the numbers that we have um, look significantly lower than what we would need um, to fully fund those. And can you tell me um, how many weeks the jobs are gonna last this year? Did we exp exp expand them? Um, and how many hours are young people gonna be working? for both 14 and 18 year olds and 19 to 24 year olds? Uh, sure, so in terms of just the, um, the calculation of just the, um, you know, the number of jobs, so um, I would say that we, so we look at the hourly wage that young people are able to make. Um, so with our, with our Success Link Youth Jobs Program, young people are paid minimum wage. Mm -hmm. um, minimum wage um, is 14, 25 an hour for this upcoming summer. Um, and then we pretty much, um, you know, just consider the number of hours a young people, young people will be allowed to work for the duration of the summer, which for us, um, it's um, 175 hours. Um, 175 hours is equivalent to about seven weeks of program. Um, so that is how we're looking at just a calculation of just the number of jobs. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, time frame, um, so our summer jobs program is running um, from Monday, June 26th or 7th, um, <laughs> whatever that Monday is, um, through August, um, the last Friday in August, which again is probably August 20, um, maybe 27th or 26th or so. Um, and through, so that's about nine weeks. And through those nine weeks, we, we again, allow young people to work um, about 175 hours, which is seven weeks. Okay, so from I so I have the budget calculations here, and so the cost of one job is I know, I know, I know about twenty four hundred dollars, right? Um, for a fourteen to an eighteen year old, and about four thousand dollars for a nineteen to a twenty four year old. So we have, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I have this number, maybe like twelve million, I think, somewhere along those lines, allotted for for the jobs, and based on the cost of those jobs for the summer, and then the school year jobs, which is. Um, around six thousand dollars and then fourteen thousand dollars for fourteen to eighteen year old and nineteen to twenty four year olds respectively uh, we're talking about twenty seven million right one million that would come from the state contribution to DYE and then twenty six million from the city mm -hmm. so what's in the budget right now is half of that mm -hmm. so can you tell me what the twelve million is for what it represents how much are you calculating the cost of one job yeah. and how many jobs do you have Yep, so the, the way that the city has, our, our department of jobs have been funded um, is 
we fund the, the summer jobs program um, with the understanding and the expectation that um, you know there will be a surplus. Um, and a surplus means that not every young person um, will work the full duration of the summer. Um, and then with that surplus, um, what traditionally has happened is that surplus has um, contributed to the school year jobs, um, which has allowed for us to um, provide school year job opportunities. So um, in my five years of being here, um, we've never fully just budgeted for summer and school year separately. Um, it has been a large focus on the summer um, and then any you know additional um, surplus that is left over that has gone to fund the school year. Based on the cost of one job that I have here, mm -hmm. the budget to fully fund a summer job, right? Even if you were considering the line item for the school year jobs to be zero and you're just counting on the attrition and the leftover to fund the school year jobs, hey. the summer jobs alone is 15 million. That's mm -hmm. under the budget that you had. That's under, so um, help me help you. <laughs> Right. Said that, say that one more time. So the number is still low. Even if you're counting on the attrition and the leftover to fund the school jobs, the number is still significantly low based on the cost of the job here that I have for one job. It's still not in alignment. So are you not funding? Are you not funding the school year jobs at all and waiting for and using the surplus for it? So yeah, traditionally, um, that is what has happened, um, is that, you know, the surf plus has largely gone towards the school year jobs. Largely. So not, you're not at zero for school year. You're just mostly. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you, will the school year jobs be September to June? The school year jobs run from about November to April. Um, and that, that is largely because it takes about two months or so for us to set up the jobs in our city's ISIMS platform. Um, and that consists of everything from um, terminating young people from summer jobs um, to really just setting up the workflows um, for a new season um, in the city's ISIMS hiring system um, to releasing a partner application, having partners apply. Um, so in order so to increase the jobs and start the jobs from September to June, it sounds like it's logistical. It is. Would it's you need extra positions to make that happen? I'm sorry? Would you need extra positions in your departments to make that happen? Um, I think it's largely just looking at um, an infrastructure um, mm -hmm. that we're using um, to manage the youth jobs program. Because um, we're, we're hiring young people as City of Boston employees, yep. and we're using the city's hiring platform to do that. So it's looking at... So software. Um, yeah, an investment in a separate technical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, were 14 year olds going to be able to apply and not just the ones that are about to turn 14, but just all 14 year olds? Yeah, so we've, um, we've adjusted the, um, the age to ensure that 14 year olds can apply. So you um, have expanded it, so 14 year olds are now going to be eligible? 14 year olds are eligible. Okay, beautiful. Um, the Department of Youth and Gate, well, your department, um, s stated last year that they wanted to increase from 19, the, the um, pay rate for 19 to 24 year olds. Um, to $17 an hour by next year. So where are we in that transition? Are 19 to 24 year olds being paid 14.75 now? Um, and what will the pay rate be in the summer and next year? Are we, are we all, you know, on track? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so if, um, 19 and 24 year olds are making $16 an hour um, this summer. Um, and typically what we've done is as minimum wage has increased, um, we have also increased the hourly rate for those 19 to 24 year olds as well. So minimum wage will go up to $15 um, in um, January 2023. Um, and the expectation is for the, um, the hourly rate for the supervisors to go up as well. Okay. And how many slots do you have for the Dreamer Fellowship? Um, so currently for this, um, the Spring Dreamers Fellowship, there's about 140. Um, positions available, and then this summer, I think we're looking at roughly about 200, between 200 and 240. Okay, and how many weeks is that? Um, the Dreamers Fellowship, so we, we, in partnership with Moya, we release a, um, an RFP um, to a pro, um, an, an agency, an immigrant organization that serves as a program administrator, um, and that program administrator has really designed, you know, the, the terms and the length of the program. Um, so, you know, I don't have the, the number of weeks in front of me, mm -hmm. um, but I think those young people are, are working um, 
roughly about the same time as our successing employees, which is about six weeks during the summer. Okay. Madam Chair, was that my time? Do you um, want to ask another question? I have one final question before I Stop disrupting your hearing. <laughs> Thank you, You're Madam fine. Chair. Mm -hmm. um, in, there were $800,000 that were invested in the new young adult jobs that we were funded last year. Is that continuing? Can you tell me more about that? Uh, yeah, so I think, um, so the expectation is that that grant will go out um, once we're able to um, just hire a grants and budget manager. Mm -hmm. um, about 500000 of that is ARPA funding, so it's one-time funding. Yep. Um, so I think it's really just, you know, thinking about where the additional investment comes in after, you know, that one time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. No further questions. Thank you so much. Right. And my office will follow up with some stuff about some of your answers. Yep. Thank Thanks, you. Council. Council Block, you have the floor. Great, thanks so much. Um, and just tagging on to Councillor Lara's question, um, so but so obviously ARPA dollars they just have to be expended by 2026. But the 300,000 in the operating budget last year that Councillor Mejia mentioned is that being re-upped or no? So the request to budget will be for that to be re-upped to support the um, uh, to support this grant. But does is that reflected in the budget that you guys have filed with us? I'm sorry. But is that reflected in the budget filed with us? I don't think that the ARPA. Not the ARPA dollars. Those would be. Those wouldn't be. But the 500 is definitely separate yep. and already appropriated. Mm -hmm. But the 300 that was appropriated last year would turn into a pumpkin with everything else on June 30th. So is that mm -hmm. being renewed? So it is not requested in the fiscal year 23 budget um, because the expectation was, was that this grant would um, obviously be out the door before the end of the fiscal year. Right, so how are you gonna pay for the grant manager then? I'm, I'm sorry? So, so then like, how's the, right, because it didn't get out, but you still think it's gonna get out before the end of the fiscal year? So the, the considering the, the time frame it will take um, for right. us to um, post a position, hire someone for the position, um, you know, I think the likelihood is that it probably won't, but the grant manager is not being funded through that. That was, a, that was an additional FTE that we requested. Right, but I think Councilor Mejia, if she were here, would say that means that the 800,000 that she got last year for these uh, adult youth jobs is going down to 500 because the 300's not gonna get out the door in the next two months. Is that an accurate understanding of the situation? I would say that's accurate um, unless we're able to, again, request for, um, with budget, uh, for that to be kind of just rolled over. Okay, all right, so that'll be, I think, a point of follow-up for the council. And then also in the category of follow-up, I, I would love to get a more granular snapshot on the like what our sort of that job profile actually was last year. Like I think a lot of the back and forth between you and Councilor Lara has to do with the fact that like, you know, not all not all youth do the seven weeks, right? And we know we've gone over many times the fact that sometimes that's by their own volition, sometimes that's been because of our administrative challenges. And I think obviously moving towards the grants program was an important like assistance in that front, um, but it's still a challenge. Um, and I think the council has asked before for kind of a breakdown of like, okay, uh, like what's the bell curve of, of all the youth that we're employing? How many are only working for two weeks? How many are working for seven, right? Kind of like, what does that data distribution look like? How many school jobs um, have we, you know, you, you gave some of the numbers for a number of total school jobs over the last couple of years, but again, kind of understanding how many folks worked that full November to, is it April or May? April. April, right? Like versus how many people got hired in like January or February? Like I think the council wants more granular data on all of that just to understand like what that distribution of, of jobs looks like. Yeah. Um, and I think it would help put us all more on the same page of kind of like what your guys' costs, effective costs per job are, yeah. and also identify some of the you know, the pain points that we can continue to do better. I mean, I think, I think I'll, I'll just speak for, I think lots of the counselors, you know, we want to help you guys advocate with OHR in terms of like the process challenges, you know, on the, I know that again, we've taken some of the weight off of that by shifting some of the jobs, but I think it's still something. Um, and definitely, I mean, <laughs> Councillor Lara is just finding out about the software challenge that keeps us from moving it up, but you know, obviously that, request to actually start them with the school year has been a continuing thing that I think we still 
want to figure out. It should feels like it shouldn't be administratively impossible for us to get there. Um, so those are sort of points of, of further follow-up, I think. I was wondering if, if you could talk a little bit um, on the grants program about like, you mentioned a lot of our partners being excited that we have it, and I agree, that's the feedback I've heard as well, but I also did hear some feedback on the pilot sort of in terms of like things that could run better this year, and so I wondered if you guys could speak a little bit to what you've adjusted um, it, now that we've had a, the benefit of a year of experience there. Uh, sure. So um, we did conduct a grant partner convening um, during the summer of 2021, um, in which um, that was a format to be able to gather um, some feedback from those um, organizations that participated as a grant partner. Um, and, you know, largely uh, there was two major pieces of feedback. Um, one was um, whether or not you know, we would be able to increase the administrative um, cost for organizations to be able to, you know, support the administrative responsibilities yeah, like the fringe. of managing, yeah, you know, too. a grant program, um, you know, and then the other was um, just organizations wanting to know, um, you know, upfront the data um, that we're asking for them to collect um, from the youth employees. So there is a youth data spreadsheet um, that we're asking for our grant partners to submit to us so that we can have um, documentation around demographics served. Um, we were asking them to collect um, documentation so that we can ensure age eligibility and residency um, of the young people that they're employing as well. Um, so, you know, those are some things that they, you know, shared back with us. Um, you know, I think um, the, the fringe cost, um, I think that's a con a, an ongoing conversation um, uh, from the lens of where does that funding come from? Um, certainly, you know, the, you know, the fringe that we're providing right now is coming from our youth jobs budget, um, as we know. Um, so if we are to increase um, any type of administrative, you know, fees for these organizations that are grant partners, um, is that separate money that actually needs to be raised? Um, or is that money that is coming from the youth jobs uh, our budget line for youth jobs? So in, you're currently not proposing to increase the fringe or administrative support for the organization? Yep. So in, in consultation with um, administration of finance, so largely that is um, treasury um, and auditing. Um, so what, we're, what we've offered um, is 2.4% just general admin and then 7.6% um, fringe, right? Um, so that 7.6% fringe, um, the organizations that are able to take advantage of that um, counselor are largely the organizations that are putting young people on their payroll, right? So that they're, they're um, you know, as an agency, they're actually responsible for that fringe because they're paying young people as employees. Um, and then the 2.4% um, is just general admin. Um, so those are not those are rates that we received from again our administration and finance team, um, and it will be you know um, we would need to go back to them and just have that conversation around where there is flexibility to increase those rates. But those are those rates are not determined um, just by us alone. Got it. So something to ask Treasury about as well. Um, what about, you know, obviously it, it seems like a lot of the things that we were excited to have happen when we were having budget hearings last year with the new staff positions just haven't been able to happen because you haven't had the new staff. Um, one of those was this question of kind of like how we evaluate the, you know, the kind of like workforce development and like educational like value of the, of the various op opportunities that we offer young people wanting to have these be like high quality opportunities. Um, and, and of course, and I think that's a little bit indirectly connected to this fringe conversation because one of the things that I've heard from organizations is, you know, we'd love to have the capacity to have like more mentor support for the young people beyond like, you know, what we can kind of afford on this budget. And so then it becomes like, can they independently fundraise to, to have like, you know, a one to five instead of one to 10 ratio for supervisors for the young people because they're doing something complex that you're trying to teach them, right? Like that kind of thing. And it feels like if we had a little bit more of a robust lens on on like the quality of programming, that would also lead us to support maybe some of these things. And so I'm just curious kind of, is that work basically where it was a year ago? Do you feel like we've, have we done anything in the interim? 
in light of the staffing, like despite the staffing challenges, or is that kind of on deck for the summer? Like, can you just speak to that a bit, Rashad? And then I have uh, my timer. Yeah, sure. Um, so we are, um, we do have a three-year research practice partnership uh, with Northeastern University, um, in which the goal of that grant um, is to really just look at, you know, the, uh, the impact of our youth jobs program um, and assess, um, you know, the quality experiences of, of both the young people and the partners that are participating. Um, so while we, um, so there was a youth data and evaluation um, position um, that we're also hiring for as well. Um, but while that role is actually not hired for, we have been working um, with Alicia Monastino and the Northeastern team um, to begin to collect more data and really conduct that data analysis and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with partners um, so that that can help inform um, some of the recommendations to improve the quality job experiences for the young people. So I would say, um, you know, yes, there have been some parts um, of that work that has continued um, this past year, um, but in terms of that just being the full responsibility of a staff person um, to, you know, develop um, evaluation tools um, to measure those specific things, that is something that is going to be the responsibility of that data and evaluation person that is coming into the role. And with data collect, we've so we've done data collection. Uh, excuse me. Sorry, with Northeastern. Council yeah. Bach, you're about two minutes over. Sorry, but, sorry. Um, my apologies. Wrap up that last question. Oh, just I'm just clarifying with the Northeastern partnership. Are we solely in the data collection space still? Have we started doing data analysis or recommendations yet with them, or are we not there yet? Yep. So we are still collecting the data. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, would um, all of the folks that are signed up to for public testimony um, move down to these tables here? Thank you. And three on virtual. Thank you. I, uh, meanwhile, I have some questions um, for you, and then we can move on to public testimony. Um, so as far as the young adults, um, the 19 uh, to what, what ages do you, up to what age do you 24. 24. support? 24. Um, do, you, do we actually have an analysis, and you'd have to forgive me that I'm new and not sure what kind of work you've put in place in the previous year, but I also think it's um, helpful for the folks listening at home as well. Do you have some sort of analysis that gives you sort of um, the need um, or like s sort of like the need or um, how to support young adults with like trainings that takes them to or transitions them to actual like more permanent workforce? So I would say, um, no, we don't. Um, and just for information purposes, um, the, the, there's two components of our work when it comes to serving 19 to 24 year olds. One is as a part of our current success link program, we do offer job opportunities to 19 to 24 year olds. Um, but that, that initiative, um, you know, is an initiative in which the partner organizations identify those young adults that they're actually interested in just providing a summer job experience to. Um, that is, so that's separate. Uh, we provide about 400 opportunities for those 19 and 24 year olds during summer months. Um, in terms of just um, data collection around just training and development needs for 19 and 24 year olds, that is not something that our office um, you know, has collected from um, just across the city. Thank you. Um, do you. So do you have any plans to do that? Do you think that would be helpful? Yeah, I, we definitely think that, um, you, know, the, you know, the growing need for figuring out job opportunities, workforce training opportunities for 19 and 24 year olds um, is something that our department um, absolutely, you know, believes in and we want to be a part of those conversations. Um, I think it, it is also a new space um, that our office has been, you know, just, you know, exploring in terms of how we could better serve those 19 and 24 year olds um, and also really defining what our role is in that space as well. 
How old is your department? I'm sorry? How old is your department? Um, so this office has, ooh, has been around um, for, um, the program um, council has been around for about 25 plus years. Um, I mean, it started out as Boston Youth Fund, Red Shirts, but it has largely supported those 15 to 18 year olds. Um, and I think, you know, over the last, um, you know, four years or so, five years since I've been in my role, um, we've been just thinking about ways to expand those opportunities for those 19 to 24 year olds. Thank you. Um, so, thank you, Car. Uh, Coral. I noticed that in your top 10 paid, um, majority are male, and it seems pretty diverse in terms of race, but your top 10 paid um, salary earners are Yeah, out of 10, there's only one female. Um, is there, is there, can you, can you tell me about that? Was there a reason for that or are we working to change that? Um, so I, I, to be transparent, um, so over the past year, four, one, two, three, four, um, five. Four, what are you four, telling me? No, no, I'm just, the number of, um, Females that have transitioned out of the department um, have been about four over the last year. Um, so I think it'll be helpful to kind of just um, kind of just check the data that's there in terms of um, there are currently um, four males that are full time employees that are left in the department. But up until this year, um, our department predominantly have been females that have been in full time staffing roles. Yeah, I, I'm only talking about the top salary earners. Mm -hmm. So your top 10 is nine males and one female. Yeah, so I think um, it will, we'll have to get back to you on that so I can actually just assess um, what information um, that is. The one you gave me of top department salary earners by race and gender. Mm -hmm. One black female, four black males, zero white females one white male and a total of five males and one female. So, and then, and then it goes on to like adding in other races, but there are basically predominantly black, I mean, um, sorry, predominantly males, top salary earners, mm -hmm. and then only one female. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would just say that how many, how many, um, employees you have? Um, this past year we have nine FT em employees. Okay, and so like the top earners are all male? E yes, considering the transitions. Okay, I understand. Um, and then we're looking to change that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, gender diversity is of the utmost importance for this office, um, and again, you know, this, um, the department has, you know, been predominantly, um, you know, female probably up until the transitions that have happened this past year. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I like that it's predominantly black males, right? Because this issue impacts predominantly black boys. So it should be that way. It just can't be like mostly male, yeah. right? Um, so I agree that it should be predominantly black men, but, um, I guess, as long as we're working on making it equitable in terms of increasing um, gender diversity. Um, I didn't see any like breakdown of your contracts. Do we know at all what, what we're doing, like how we're doing on that in terms of MBEs or, you know, male, um, women owned or black contractors? Yeah, our, our budget is largely just youth wages. Um, so I, we don't really have many contracts. Um, I mean, outside of just like some, I think t-shirt purchasing, and <laughs> I think that might be one of the largest um, expenses, um, and then maybe some systems that we're using as well. Um, it would it would be helpful to understand their con their um, demographics, though. Yeah. I mean, last year so far, I, well, I see one hundred and thirty three thousand, and then you're proposing like four million. 
Yeah, so I think a quick clarification in terms of just contractor services line. Please. So that's also the line that funds those grant jobs. Mm -hmm. So those are not necessarily like, those are, those are that's funding that's going out the door to these nonprofit organizations that employ the young people. And then it'd be good if you create a dashboard mm -hmm. that you keep track of those nonprofits who yeah. owns them, mm -hmm. whether or not they're minority or mm -hmm. women owned. Because even the nonprofits, right? Like they tend to be white top heavy, like same issue. Absolutely. They tend to be white owned. Like they tend, you, we tend to sometimes, most of the time, city of Boston, we're contracting outside of Boston, we're contracting white, like a disproportionate number. It's not even like close to representing the demographics that we're serving. Sure. And that's like across the board in departments. And I think, you know, if you can, if you can, if you know that information, submit that even if it's on just 133,000 mm -hmm. and then moving forward we're looking for information like that so we're more intentional about how we're building equity absolutely mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you in terms of success link and i'll wrap up with that question because i didn't even time myself but i'm quite sure i'm reaching eight minutes um what um can you please provide a breakdown by age and if you can't right now like it's fine um by age, uh, how many hours they worked, and uh, what weeks in the summer they worked. Uh, please provide the same breakdown for supervisor positions. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we can provide. I think that's some of the data that um, Council Bach was um, requesting. Um, so I think we can work on pulling all information together. And provide okay. That. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, can you provide the same breakdown, like with the types of jobs that are available to youth and the demographics that we're trying to reach yep. as well? We have that. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess I'm more interested in my first question in terms of assessing how we're reaching at risk youth um, and how we're intentional in understanding the need. Um, it sounds like there's obviously some sort of need for, for an assessment. Council Rell filed this hearing order for um, requesting a conversation around data and how we're using that to inform our programs or our budget. Um, I'd be really interested to see where your department goes next in terms of assessment, creating an assessment to actually understand the need. Mm -hmm. And we, we know, we know, you know, where we need to go because the need we know like, you know, black communities, black boys first. Um, but we don't necessarily, if we don't have numbers, if we don't actually understand like, you know what I mean? In terms of how to target. So we're just kind of like blindly just employing people. Yeah. All right, um, I'll, I'll, I'll ye yield there and um, we'll go to public testimony first in person. And we have four people, Arlene, Rodriguez and George Lee, um, Carmelo, sorry, I can't see your last name. How? And Kyra Nunez? Hi, welcome. So um, we'll go in that order that you signed in. You have um, two minutes, and I'm actually allowing for questions for, to be answered today for responses. So this is the way, the best time, way to do it. If you can just um, use your two minutes to say all of your questions, they're taking notes on your questions and then they'll respond, uh, but that there is no uh, back and forth in terms of like debating back and forth. Just they'll give their response and if, if you feel your question hasn't been answered, you can say so and we'll take it from there. Okay, sounds, sounds good. good. Okay, great. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please um, state your name and address or affiliation. Great. Um, good afternoon. My name is Arlene. Sorry. Name and affiliation is fine. I realize you <laughs> might be underage. Uh, my name is Arlene Rodriguez. I am the manager of public policy for Break Time. Um, break Time is a Boston based nonprofit working to break the cycle of young adult homelessness. And I'm here today to speak in support of increasing funding for summer and year round youth employment opportunities. Um, break Time accomplishes our mission. We uh, provide young adults experiencing homelessness with a year-long supportive transitional employment opportunity at nonprofits and small businesses across the greater Boston area. Currently, 85% of our associates and alumni identifies BIPOC and 33% identifies LGBTQ+. Uh, we 
As an organization, we work to support young adults experiencing homelessness. Break Time recognizes the efforts set forward by this department to develop employment opportunities for the youth. And we'd like to thank Mayor Wu, City Council, and the entire administration for their partnership to serve our most vulnerable young adults in the city. Uh, increasing youth employment funding will help ensure that we are able to serve all young adults in need of summer and year-round employment. Uh, we applaud Mayor Wu's efforts to increase funding for the Department of Youth Engagement and Employment. And today, it's asking for members of Boston City Council to go one step further to ensure that funds appropriated to this department are not just expanded, uh, but are directly distributed to nonprofit organizations in Boston that can serve young adults directly. Uh, last year, City Council voted to approve $800,000 in funding for year-round youth employment programming for youth and young adults through a combination of uh, ARPA dollars and general funds. Break Time is appreciative of these efforts and asks today that Council not only sustains this invest investment over time, but also increases these funds to at least $1 million for young adults needing access to employment opportunities. The current proposal is to increase the budget of DYEE by 13.8% over the pre previous fiscal year, and the promising step is fueled by an increase in contractual services through this department. Uh, break, break time and nonprofit organizations across the city would benefit from these funds being contracted directly from the city to programs. This would also provide a direct benefit to the city as this form of contracting would reduce overhead costs to the city. And I know I'm out of time, so. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. George, you have the floor. George Lee. Thanks. Um, one just heads up is someone, Markeisha Moore, who's joining by phone on Zoom, um, has a hard stop at six, so she was just hoping she could be called on earlier in the Zoom order if possible. Yeah, so um, can you give them, um, please ask uh, because we're, we're just going to keep going anyway. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for chairing this hearing and asking questions and being here to present. Um, also want to acknowledge steps that Mayor Wu has taken um, since she uh, signed on to a letter supporting increase in youth jobs a couple years ago. She has increased the youth jobs budget to um, 12.6 million. Thank you so much for the good news about 14 year olds today. That's something um, that's gonna impact um, lots of young people in really great ways. Um, I just wanna touch on the fact that investing in youth, youth jobs, um, I'm, I'm with Youth Justice and Power Union and we work on multiple issues and youth jobs is really important to us as an issue of racial justice and as an example of what happens when um, BIPOC communities are systematically disinvested in. Um, while they're over policed and folks are locked up instead. Um, a lot of these jobs are going to BIPOC young people. A lot of them are young women, non-binary, queer and trans, unhoused. A lot of the folks who get labeled as gang members in BRICS gang database um, are folks who don't get access to opportunities um, and don't have housing. And we need more jobs, more opportunities um, at every level. I think part of how this is reflected is the egregious overspending on policing where they already have an enormous overtime budget, and yet they're allowed to blow past it every year. On the other hand, for youth jobs, as you heard today, money is allocated, and it's not even spent on youth jobs. And so there's just a profound mismatch in our priorities of why we can spend $10, $15 million extra on policing, but not spend the amount allocated for youth jobs, which has been a, a systematic pattern over many years in Boston with um, underspending on youth jobs. Um, so we need that data to understand how many um, youth jobs are actually provided for. Um, and uh, another element is that 19 to 24 year olds, it's, we're confused if they are gonna go up to 17 an hour. We were looking at someone's pay stub for this school year and their pay stub only said 14.75 an hour, um, which seems very low compared to what it should be. And so making sure that it's actually high for the summer and school year and gets to 17. And um, to make sure we really go through September through June, we've heard for two years that there's these computer issues, but SuccessLink is giving grants now. You can give grants to organizations to hire people September through June. You can hire someone to fix your computer systems. Um, we really can't have people going basically for almost half the year without a job because of these gaps. Um, and this is our third time on this merry-go-round of, of hearing why we can't do September through June. 
So my direct questions are, how much are 19 to 24 year olds getting paid for this school year, next summer and next school year? Um, and um, what are the solutions to really make the September through June a, a reality? Thank you. George, um, thank you for your questions and hello to you. Um, so to answer the first question in terms of the hourly rate for the supervisors, um, so again, as minimum wage has gone up, um, so this upcoming um, summer, um, those 19 to 24 year olds, which we consider success link leaders, um, that's what we term them, um, will be making $16 an hour. Um, and then the expectation is that as minimum wage goes up to $15 an hour, which will happen next um, January, um, then the expectation is for the, um, those leader positions to also go up um, as well. So minimum wage will increase 75 cents. Um, so the expectation is that um, we will be able to raise the supervisor rates to um, roughly about $17 an hour. Um, so that is the first question. Um, and then the second question, um, in terms of just the, the timeline for the school year jobs program, um, as mentioned to Council Alara, um, it is simply, um, you know, just a conversation around, um, you know, for the direct jobs, it, it is a conversation around the technical infrastructure. Um, we did not provide grant partner jobs for the school year. We did provide them last summer as a pilot initiative. They are being offered this summer as well. Um, but those opportunities were not a part of the last year's school year program. Um, there are conversations within our office around how we can make that a year round um, initiative. Um, you know, just learning from the initial pilot that was launched last summer. So those are um, conversations that our team will be having, um, and we do have every intention to, in, to make sure that that grant partnership initiative becomes a year-round initiative. Did he, are you, did he answer already? I wasn't sure if I, because you said I couldn't do back and forth, so I wasn't sure. Oh, sure, sure, uh, unless he, unless there was a question unanswered. Yeah, I guess just to clarify, because the, the pay stubs we saw for right now, because we're already in 2022, said 1475, when you said it was going up to 16 this summer. Is that accurate that it's only 1475 this summer? And um, I guess I feel like you explained again why it was challenging um, to do this, the September through June, and I'm glad you all are looking at this. I'm glad they're looking at the school year jobs to get grants out to organizations, but um, will that happen for next year? And are there any other solutions that they see to making September through June a reality? Um, given the obstacles that they need. Yep, so for the current school year, George, um, those leaders are being paid at that 14, 75 an hour. Um, but that is also because minimum wage for the school year program was also, um, it's currently at 14.25, so it was 13, 13.50. Um, so, um, and so those were numbers for last school year. Um, so as we've gone into the new, the new year, as minimum wages increase, we have increased the hourly rate for those leader positions. So that is why um, the leader rate is currently at 1475 um, for this current school year program, because that is the rate when the school year program started, if that makes sense. Um, I guess I would suggest in January it would have been good if that 1475 had been bumped up when minimum wage went up to 1425 because right now leaders are only getting paid 50 cents more than the 14 to 18 year olds that they're supervising and it's really hard for a lot of them to make ends meet on that amount of money and I don't know if, if it would be kept at 16 next January because that's when the school year starts and it's supposed to be bumped up to 17 next January um, which would be an advocacy. Yeah, I, I can quickly say that because of minimum wage, uh, it's a federal wage, um, that the city automatically increase the, the minimum wage for those, fifth, those 14 to 18 year olds that were being employed during the school year. Um, so that is something that was um, automatically adjusted because minimum wage went up. Um, so I think that what we... Um, what about the leaders? What ages can they be? 
They're them? 19 and 24 year olds. Those, uh, okay, so then they get paid, is that accurate? Only 50 cents over? For the, car, so for the current school year, which is um, the 2021-2022 school year, um, yes, that is accurate. But I think what he is saying is that the youth rate went up from 13, 15 to 14, 25. Um, but that went up because that is a federal mandate to increase um, minimum wage. So that is not something that we, we didn't make that adjustment. Yeah, but I think he's also saying, yeah, that's going up. But if you're paying the leaders that are adults now, you know, so let's do something about it. That's yeah. what he's saying. Yeah. So are we, are we looking into that or? So I do think that that is a um, conversation that, again, we can have with Treasury and OHR um, that makes those adjustments just during the year. I mean, we have to incentivize young adults, right? And mm -hmm. so paying them minimum wage or just a little bit over what is now increased on the other side, then it's, I don't know. I, don't, I, 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 I totally understand. And then in, in Boston, as a young adult getting paid that, it's just... Like who lives, who can, who can eat after mm -hmm. earning that, right? Yeah. Um, how can we help on that end? Or so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's really an internal conversation around just the, um, the process to adjust the hourly rate just during, um, during the, Effective the, the, implement, yeah, the implementation while the program is actually implemented. The way that the, starting in July. No, no. So starting in July, the the the, the leader rate, which is the nineteen and twenty four year olds, they will be making sixteen dollars an hour. So that increase from the fourteen fifty that George is um, referencing, it has already been um, adjusted to sixteen dollars. I an thought hour. you were going to say something like twenty dollars an hour. Yeah. So so no, it's it's not for those. We can again. I think the conversation is to kind of go back and have um, a discussion with Office of Budget Management around what are we looking to pay those um, 19 and 24 year olds, um, and then um, be able to just get budget approval around what that increase should be. Um, I think it is important to know that those leader, um, the wages for the leaders um, is the, is. Um, dollars that is coming from the same budget for the youth jobs as well. So I think it's really just looking at um, increase what the increases um, will cost um, of adjusting, you know, the pay to you know twenty dollars an hour. Which we're totally on board with um, ensuring that you know there are opportunities for young adults to earn more. That is something that our office totally believes in. Um, but it's just having that conversation around where does that impact the actual budget. And if there is an increase in actual wages, then I think that that can also just justify an increase in budget to support that as well. Thank you, uh, just thank you for kind of digging more into this. It's, it's much more helpful than sometimes we ask questions and then feel like nothing happens. So it's, it's just good to get more into it. Thank you both. Thank you, George. Thanks, George. Uh, thank you, George. I'm going to pause you for a second. We have to get to um, Markeisha. Um, Carrie, if we can get Markeisha on, since she has a hard stop at six. Thank you everyone for your patience. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Oh, wait. Um, I don't know where the mic is on my computer. <laughs> can okay. you hear me now? We can hear you can hear clearly you. now. Okay. So, Welcome, uh, Markeisha. State your name and affiliation um, district if you want to, and you have two minutes for your testimony. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Markeisha Moore, and I'm from Dorchester, Massachusetts, um, and I am affiliated with Dorchester Not For, Dot Not for Sale and also um, CTAB, Coalition for a Truly Affordable Boston. Um, so I am here to testify about, um, youth jobs, just, um, you know, I wanted just to say some things, Mayor Wu increased, you know, I want to thank her for increasing the youth job funding, um, you know, that was a positive step, but we're asking for 26 million, which is the real cost of like 600. Um, summer jobs and 
1,500 school year jobs. And I want to say like number one, youth jobs are important to me because I think they are one piece of the puzzle in, in having resources for our youth so that they can lead better lives and have better lives and get out of, you know, like just help them move forward um, better. But there were a couple of things that I heard that were <clears throat> concerning. Number one is that um, we, there's money that, that is in the funding right now, like for youth jobs that have not been spent. And I think it's um, I, not funny is not the word to say, but um, you know, we have, money, I see them being policed every day, but we're not getting the jobs and the necessary resources to, to mitigate that other part of it um, out there to them. We're just holding on to the funding and, and hoping that, you know, I don't know what we're hoping for, but we need to get these jobs out, out to the youth, number one. And number two, I heard that, you know, um, we're talking about like raising, raising um, the limit, you know, raising the, the pay raise for the, the older youth that sometimes they are on their own and they have to make a living. And like there was some back and forth, but if there's, oh, I'm, I, I'm, I know I'm over, but I just wanted to say if there's some fundings that's still there, I think that that should, could be used toward that also. Um, so that that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Markeisha. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Markeisha. Um, we can return to um, our panel, Sarah. I mean, uh, sorry, <laughs> our um, uh, the public that's here um, in the chamber to testify. And Carmelo, you're next, and then Kaira. Okay. Um, my name is Carmelo Howe. I'm a junior who goes to the O'Brien School. Um, I live in District 7, and I'm part of YGVU along with George. First, I'd like to thank the mayor for adding to the youth budget. I appreciate the things that have been done in the budget around summer and youth jobs. I appreciate how the total budget has increased to 12.6 million, and I also extremely appreciate how they added 14-year-olds to, um, to like success link in the jobs, because I think that was like around when I started looking for a job and it was extremely hard at that age. And I like how she plans to have 6,000 new summer jobs and 1,500 school year jobs. But um, the there's like the discrepancy in the budget that it would not allow for 6,000 summer jobs and 1,500 school year jobs because there's just not enough in the budget. Um, I, did the, I had done the math and I um, I'd calculated the total amount of paper job times the uh, number of jobs and we got the total cost for summer jobs and school year jobs. We added the admin cost for hosting organizations to that and we got around 27 million, which is more than double the current proposed budget, which is 12.6 million. And I just demand, or I'm just asking that we add more to, that, more to the budget so we can get closer to the amount of jobs we were fully proposed. So I was just, Wondering, I just wanted to ask, how did you guys get the amount of, or how did you guys like get to the budget that you had gotten for 6,000 summer jobs and 15 school year jobs? Because 12.6 million isn't anywhere near what we had gotten. Sure. Yep, thank you for that question. Um, so, um, as I think also as mentioned um, to Councilor um, Lara, um, so the way that the um, the budget for our department um, has typically worked is we um, we've budgeted for the summer, um, and then any um, just surplus dollars um, have been used to actually um, roll over and support the school year. Um, so that is. Um, that's typically how it's actually been considered. Um, you know, I, I do think that um, there is a larger conversation, again, in partnership with, um, you know, administration of finance and OBM 
um, to really kind of just look at, you know, this $27 million number and, um, you know, and exactly, you know, where, what, what's feasible, you know, just, um, you know, for an investment in our department budget. But, um, you know, just for the five years that I have been here, you know, it's just, it's largely been, you know, the attrition um, from the summer has been used to support the school year um, and not the school year just being fully budgeted for itself. Thank you. Um, how did you guys come up with this 6,000 number? I'm not up to date, I'm new. Please uh, help me understand. Was this a number that was promised by the city? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so Mayor Wu has um, had made this investment to increase the number of jobs from 5,000 to 6,000. She made the um, investment, was it a promise? Um, was it like, was it like, this is what I want to do? Because the investment is not there yet. Yeah, it's, it's to increase the number of jobs from 5,000. So it was really the number of jobs from 5,000 to 6,000. So then if we so pay, okay, okay, so just sorry, just so for the record and for those who are listening, I want to read this into record. Um, so summer jobs, um, that if you increase 6,000, from 5,000 to 6,000, you said? From 5,000 to 6,000. Okay, and then, um, and that would be about, how did you come up with the, with the figure that it would be 5,400 jobs for 14 to 18 year olds? If you start talking, you'll stop. I was, I was just an, I was just an estimate based on, I don't know, um, Rashad, if you could help clarify that when you had about 4,000 youth summer jobs, I think maybe about 10% or 400 were leaders. And so this was just kind of a based on an estimate if there were 6,000 jobs, maybe 600 would be in the 19 to 24 year old range. That sounds about right. Yeah, so the 4,000 with the 4,000 jobs, um, with the 5,000 jobs, um, 400 of them, yeah, were leaders. Um, so if this is, uh, yeah. So, okay. So I think this is a guesstimation, a guesstimation I, I guess, George. Of how many yeah. you would need. Yeah. And Council Block, please let me know if you have to go so that I can allow you to go one more time. Um, okay. Um, so for, just to go into record, um, information on budget calculations. And um, George, state your program again, the name of your affiliation. We're part of Youth Justice and Power Union. What is it? Youth Justice and Power Union, YJPU. Thank you. Um, Youth Justice and Power Union then came up with these cal calculations that if you hire uh, 5,400 14 to 18 year olds, that would cost about $13,466,250. And then if you hired 600, am I right? Right? Okay. If you, and then, if, and then with um, 600 19 to 24 year olds that it would cost 2 million? 2.4. 2.4, right? About 2.4. Okay. And then with the, and then, and then you broke down the school year jobs. But then, isn't that over 6,000 jobs? So inside of the, the mayor's um, kind of featured budget stuff online, mm -hmm. and inside the operating budget summary um, in the budget books, um, she said that the 12.6 million would be enough for 6,000 summer jobs and 1,500 school year jobs. So those are the numbers that we used. According to, to how much an hour did you do this? Um, for the young people, uh, 1425 an hour at minimum wage until January, 15 an hour. And for the young adults, it's 17 an hour. Um, even if you adjusted the 17 down to 16, it would still be about the same. Okay, and then you came up, you said, if we did exactly what we said we were gonna do according to what the mayor, you said the mayor was promising as well as the city, then you would need 27 million well, 27 point something, uh, $27,62,625 um, instead of the what's proposed in the budget, uh, which is, is it 14? 12.6. Oh. Where am I getting this grand total? 
the, if you look at emergency employees plus contracts, it comes out to 12.6. There's other um, expenses in the department, um, but from what we can tell, that's the number for youth jobs specifically. Okay, 12.6 for the jobs. Thank you so much for the clarification. I mean, I think that's it's important in terms of transparency to, you know, if we have information like this coming from the community, especially an advocate who is working with youth and advocating for youth jobs, that we are transparent in these conversations and put it all into record. That's the point of you know, doing that, as, as, and I don't mean to make it more convoluted. Um, so for the sake of transparency, if we were saying that this was a need and it's a huge issue, and I'm strongly in support of whatever it takes to take the approach of a preventative measure as opposed to like, you know, looking at the problem, for example, looking at criminal justice and incre increasing budget <laughs> there, or looking at how we can address social determinants of health through public safety, as opposed to creating jobs, right, as opposed to addressing the issues with our youth and supporting our youth and where they need it. And I know that you guys agree with this because this is what you do. Um, so, George, did you want to say any closing statement to what we just read into record? Do you, you good? Okay, so that was good, okay. So um, just so that everyone knows that basically if we paid people, if we paid kids even 14, 50, and we paid, um, not kids, but youth, 14 to 18, 14, 50, and we paid about 600 um, people, uh, 19 to 24 year olds, uh, at about $17 an hour, and plus the jobs that we create during school year jobs, that we would need about $27 million, and the proposal just states um, tw $12 million. So um, thank you. All I can do is, uh, hopefully that's helpful, all I can do is state into the record, and you're saying that this warrants a conversation, internal conversation, to look at one, raising, and two, what else we can do in terms of and Councilor is willing to <laughs> say well, you should have this discussion with the counselors to help you increase that amount. And Madam Chair, if I may, I, I think what uh, Director Cope is also sharing as well is taking into consideration that this calculation, and thank you for this information, I think it's extremely helpful and the work that you all put behind this is extremely helpful and appreciated. Um, what I believe and what I've heard today ha that has been shared is that this is taking into account every single position for the length of time filled, right? So that's all 6,000 jobs filled for the period of time, duration of time, uh, both throughout the summer and uh, school year. And I believe what uh, Director Cope is sharing is that that typically is not the case, that there's attrition, that there's uh, a good amount of young people that don't finish the full uh, summer program and, and school year program. That being said, definitely understand that even with the math and even if you take into consideration a 30% dip, I don't know what the math, we know what the number is, that it still would not add up to the number that is being uh, proposed currently. Um, I understand that you're new in your role. I'm day 11, and so there's a lot more questions that I need to ask as well, and I do appreciate that, and just really understanding that uh, there has been an increase year after year, and this is based off of um, previous year's uh, proposed budgets as well, and so I think as I shared earlier this, um, this morning, a part of my role is gonna definitely be doing uh, listening and learning uh, to really understand fully what else we need to definitely focus on. Data, as, as Council Bach has uh, elevated and Council Lara as well. And Council Anderson. You can't, you can't, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. 100%. Thank you, I appreciate you explaining again what I already heard. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that I'm new, so I try to be as humble as possible in simplifying things so that the public can also understand what's going on. Sure. And I appreciate that you felt you could support me in that because we should work together in supporting each other and understanding all these things. Even so, when you double 12 million, it's 24. Yep. So it still doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to strongly advocate as a counselor and say this number does not help. The police budget looks like the way it does. The housing, is getting a lot of work done. Um, we're putting a lot of money in intervening. We're not putting a lot of money in preventative measures. We, are, we have to do something different. 
and it has to be more transformative. In the city of Boston, a very wealthy city, ANF came and sat here and told us that they can borrow money and pay it in less than 10 years. Like, that's how rich we are. We are so filthy rich that we can borrow millions and millions upon millions and pay it back so quickly. And I know that, and then they talked about risk, and you know, it's a risk borrowing money and how it could increase, and we have triple rate raised bonding, but we, it didn't necessarily mean that we should borrow because it was a risk. But either way, we could borrow because we are filthy rich. Boston is disproportionately impacting black people. That's getting pushed out, and this issue is way more severe and bigger than both of us, than all of us here. So in my advocacy, I'm going to be very uh, strong in saying I absolutely disagree, and I'm going to say that we just need to do better. We're not doing a good job in addressing our youth in the city of Boston. We're not doing a good job in saving our black boys in Boston, or girls, or brown uh, boys and girls in Boston. We're just not doing a good job. Yes, we are progressing, but we're not measuring. We have no metrics in understanding how we're progressing. We can't actually say, we can't actually look and say, okay, we increased num money, but we can't actually measure our progress because there's no such thing in place already. So I have to disagree. I have to say to you, yes, it's nice, I guess, that we get a couple of million increase, a million increase, but this is a severe problem bigger than all of us. And we have to work together to make sure that we're more intentional in the transformation. And I'm just so sick and tired of hearing the word equity, frankly, because it doesn't mean anything if we're not actually creating real change. So I mentioned earlier today that youth is my life. I foster parented, I'm a mom, like I'm a black mom. Like there's so much to this, so many layers and nuances to why I would s sit here and strongly disagree that we're not doing a good job. And, I, and I'm a part of it, so I'm putting the accountability on myself as well. Um, Kyra, if uh, you're ready, you have the floor for your public testimony. Hi, my name is Kyra Nunez. I live in District 7, and I'm a part of YJPU. My questions are, how many jobs were there in summer 2021, and how many school year jobs were there in 2021 to 2022 for 14 to 18 year olds? How many 19 to 24 year olds were hired in summer 2021 and the 2021 to 2022 school year? And did you reach your goal of 5,000 summer jobs? And if not, why? Great, thank you for those questions. So you, I actually may have to have you repeat some of those. Um, so I'll start with summer 2021, um, and then we can jump into school year 2021-2022. Um, um, so for summer 2021, um, the total number of jobs that were provided um, were 3,000 or hired. So again, these are um, the number of jobs in which young people actually have completed uh, the hiring process and ended up actually working, right? Um, so that's 3,345. Um, 3, um, in terms of just the number of jobs that were um, allocated out, so allocated out um, um, pretty much means that um, these are the number of jobs that were requested um, by the partner organizations that participated in the program. Um, that number was 4,115. Um, and then in terms of the number of leaders that were hired for summer 2021, um, I don't have that number. Um, so I can get that number for you guys. I didn't actually bring that number. Um, and then for the school year, um, this current school year, uh, we, um, There are 1,180 um, young people um, that are actively, um, that were actually hired and, and work for the school year. Um, and then that is out of 1,481 jobs that were allocated um, to the organizations um, that participated for the school year program. Um, and then um, same thing with the leaders, um, just need to get that number of the, 
the number of leaders that um, were a part of that, but they are a part of that number. So we need to grab that number. Um, and then was there another part to that question? So I know it was summer, school year, leaders um, and youth for both. Did you reach the goal of 5,000 summer jobs? And so, if not, why? Yep, so for summer 2021, there were not 5,000 young people hired. Um, and um, again, you know, there are a number of contributing factors there. I think um, if you um, if you think about you know just young people again navigating young people being selected for a job, um, which um, we consider as that being a placement, um, and then the number of young people that actually um, just follow through and complete the hiring paperwork um, for that job, um, which we count as hires. Um, I think that that um, that's in part. Um, an experience, um, at least since I've been here, that we do um, really see uh, it is a real, um, you know, thing. Um, and then the other part of this conversation um, that is important um, to consider is that um, off, on the heels of summer 2020, um, we uh, we also provided some funding um, to both ABCD and PIC um, because summer jobs is a collective effort. Um, so we wanted to ensure that if there was some additional funding to support um, those entities to hire young people, um, because those are still considered city jobs, um, that we, um, we had some space to be able to do that. So that was also um, the plan for summer 2021, uh, is to make some funding available to both PIC and ABCD um, and other summer job int intermediaries um, that um, had a need um, to be able to support um, job opportunities across the organizations as well. Was that it? Okay, thank you. Um, we have to turn to Councillor Bach because she has uh, to be somewhere, and then if you guys have further questions, we'll come back to you. Sounds good? Okay. Uh, Council Block, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. And yes, I actually I have to run, so I, I won't come with a second round of questions, but I'll just emphasize that um, you know, I think some of that data that we asked for earlier is really important. I strongly agree with the chair. I think this is one of the most effective ways we spend a marginal dollar in the city. And so I think trying to, you know, increase the dollars we're actually spending on this is important. I also think, though, that part of the reason why the number that you guys have is half of the number that these folks have is it's what it's basically telling us is the fact that like as a put like with the number of people who we like employ every year in the city with the youth jobs program we're basically like only managing to get about half the sort of like dollar hours of work into the hands of the youth that we sort of like titularly intend right and so i think that um one of the things that i've been trying to push on for the last few years and i think the yjpu folks have made huge strides on this like honestly like i mean you know is to say like how do we not just increase the budget authority, but also increase that like effective actual dollars that are going to young people, right? And so I think, and I think you heard that in some of Councillor Lara's questions, like this, this idea of like, we have to work on both increasing the authority and also getting those dollars in because we hate seeing them go back into treasury at the end of the year. And I think there's been some progress on the amount, like when I was looking at the amount that you guys will have expended this year versus your budget, it seems like that's driving up, um, but and I think the grants program has helped with that. But I, I agree that it's super important for us to just be using like every dollar of this budget authority. And at the end of the day, it's a jobs program, yeah. um, and with jobs programs, like it's key that people get paid, right? Like, and that money actually ends up in young people's pockets. So um, yeah, so just continue to count me in as a as a huge advocate for the department and a huge fan of your work. And I think that's the thing you're hearing from all of the counselors is that um, you know we want. We want to just continue growing this program um, and making it even more effective. So thanks to all the young people for the advocacy. I want to apologize to the couple. I think there's a couple folks on Zoom who I'm going to have to miss, but I will catch them afterwards. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for the indulgence. Thank you. Thank Councilor you, Councilor Bach. Good night. All right. Um, Shamika Moreno, is, is she available?
Hi, um, my name is Shamika Moreno. I'm a part of Boston Tennis Coalition as a board member. I'm also a part of CTEP. Uh, and I'm also a parent, facilitator for parents, helping parents. Um, so I um, am from District 6, um, Dorchester, and I am a mom of twins who actually utilize this system for the last three years. My only issue with the funding being available is that they put a cap on when you can apply. So not all kids get emails, not all kids have access to Wi-Fi, my, my sons are lucky to have that, and they have wraparound as far as like services, but not all kids have that at home. So it's the matter of even getting the job, of knowing that the jobs are starting, or you know, whatever have you, because that's how they usually operate. The school tells you you might get a leaflet or you get an email, but most teenagers don't access their email outside of school. My concern is that these youth that this funding is for, they're not reaching, the, they're not reaching the information that's given, and then they're left to the summer on the street. And as we know, there's already been an uptick in shootings and killings and burglaries and so have you. And, you know, all this money's being funded to the police, but if we gave more outreach and we actually had someone outside giving out leaflets, like, you know, hey, at the end of the school year, you know, here's a summer job that, um, application, or this is how you utilize it. Most kids have phones if they don't, their friends do. Just getting more outreach about the jobs and actually utilizing the funding. The funding should never be going back to our fiscal budget when we have so many kids in need. And the fact that they're not applying for these jobs isn't because they don't need them, because most of them are being raised by single mothers. Let's just be realistic. In most of these districts, it's single mothers, if not grandparents or siblings, raising their children. I mean, there's some single dads, but the majority, I lived in these communities. I am a single mother of five, also a full-time employee. Also, you know, my sons are disabled. My, tw my twins that are working in this job force, they are one's hard of hearing and one's profoundly deaf. And one was born with intellectual disability. They both got jobs through the summer program for the last three years. One actually is still working at Wentworth. He had a school year job. Um, it just builds. It builds a rapport with them where they understand that I have to provide for myself and this is how I should do it. Even if they don't have a parent that's teaching them those skills, this job setting will. So it's a big factor in a 14-year-old, definitely a 14-year-old getting a job because it's setting them up for a future they probably wouldn't even know they had. Financially, understanding the, the way you save money, the way you budget money, the way you provide for yourself. Some parents don't even give their kids those skill, that skill set, so a job is gonna do that for them. So starting 14 is definitely important, and giving them the knowledge of this is where you go, this is how you do it. You can go to the library, or leave leaflets at the library about some jobs. Just give more outreach. That's my concern. I appreciate the mayor giving us more funding, but let's actually utilize all of the funding because it's, it's a need. It's for sure a need, because most of these kids are buying their own school clothes, their own food. If they're not eating at home, they're eating at school. So uh, trust me when I say they need jobs. I, I can say that for a fact, that I have children that are friends of my kids that come and they eat their only meal outside of school at my home. So when I say they need a job, they want a job. It's just they don't know how to reach out and get that Ms. resource. Ms. Moreno, and thank, thank you. Them. Thank you. Yes. Your time is up. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, next we have, um, Shavar. You guys can hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. My name is Shavar. I live in the Dorchester District, and I'm with YGPU along with George and Carmelo. Um, May Wu. Shout out to her for raising the youth budget to um, 12.6 million. But um, initially we demanded 26 million, which is a real cost of 6,000 summer jobs and 1,500 school year jobs that the mayor will promise initially. Also, 14 year olds should be allowed to apply, not just to some school year jobs, but to last till September to June. And 19 to 24 year, old, 24 year olds need to be paid 17 an hour as promised. Youth jobs are important because it teaches youth independency at an early age and a better sense of responsibility with managing money and time. Youth jobs are also important because it helps teens to stay busy and pre prevent them from getting into trouble, also preparing them for the future workforce. The city council has the power to move 120 million 
from the police and to youth jobs, affordable housing, community-led mental health response, and civil details to take action to fund youth jobs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avar. Uh, Nasika Verdu. with us Okay, no worries. Um, do we have any additional folks um, to testify in person? Were you, were you testifying in person? No, no you just sitting there? Okay. Um, no problem, no worries. Um, if you guys have additional questions, I just um, have a couple and then we can go back to you. If you don't, um, it's fine, just stick around. Um, so I think Yes, data is important, and we don't have it in front of us, and it wasn't submitted fully in the RFI or in the equity questions that I, that I asked. So it's, even in contracts, if they're small, I, as a chair, I'm asking you to put that on record and actually submit them. Every question that you have here today, obviously, will be expecting it. The, if we don't get questions or answers back in time, you're delaying the whole budget process, which could lead to like rejection of the budget. Like That's a big deal. Right? So like one of the things that I ask is that hopefully we get the, our, your responses right away so that we're not calling you back and we're not uh, postponing this process. So I, I think it's also important, like this is such a huge component of the well-being of our city and yet you see that there's very poor attendance and then the youth are here and that's ex like it's exceptionally um, impressive that they're here, but also that like it speaks volumes to what the city of Boston is doing and how much like everyone is busy on this particular hearing that disproportionately impacts black and brown ch children. And so I take that extremely personal and because it's always personal, right? And as I said, because I'm a black mother, but also because um, I'm a part of this community, but because I was once a, a, a young black teenager in this situation, right? And I thank you, uh, George, and um, uh, everyone who came to testify today, because you're always here and always fighting and super organized and uh, just super efficient in your questions and participation. Um, but I think that it's not just us understanding data. Like, so I will break down and I don't, you know, and, and it's okay if you mansplain. It's okay if you do that. But what's not okay is that we are not clear on what the priorities are. If I get, if we have a budget that we're saying that it's supposed to support our youth and you're telling me that 12 million is because that half of the time we are not able to withhold, like retain the, our youth in these jobs, even at that point it should be at, you know, what, what are we talking about? Like then let's say half of $6 million is not used even that doesn't reach the number that we say, right? Are we, are we doing math? It's like 1.5 if you take the 6 million, half of it, and you increase jobs. So if you just take the three, $3 million, you're still going to be at just 15. Even that doesn't reach what we, we're saying the goal is, right? Even if we're losing half of the kids at that point, we still are not reaching what we say the goal is. So it's the, the, I think the idea, the problem here is one, assessing the need so that we can understand the data, exactly how we're reaching them and engaging. And this is not this department's issue. This is the city, all of us together, figuring out what is engagement and how we're reaching to our youth. If you don't have the tools to be able to like get to the parents or get to this, if you're not, if we're not investing millions in like digital marketing, because we know, right, we know that that's what reaches our youth, Right? If we're not figuring out exactly how to make this more, um, not just attainable, accessible, but also interesting and incentivizing, we're not doing a good job, and this is not a reflection of your department. This is what you've had to deal with 
in terms of budget, in terms of programming in the last few years prior to your time, I'm sure, and then you come in and you have to try to fix a thing. You've done an amazing job, um, Chief Masso, and to yourself, Director, to be able to grab this thing by the horn and do what you can with the money, with the tools that given. Um, and provided all of that information, we still have to be at, at an accord to be very honest and say, we're just not prioritizing our youth in the way that we should. And we're not there yet. We know that we're not there yet. And I think that was my point. Um, so throughout these hearings, um, I think that, you know, one of the issues is, is trying to sound sophisticated or fancy in our language and not really reaching the people that we say that we represent. We go out and we propagate these jargons in campaigns and we say, we're gonna fight for equity and black people and ARPA money comes in and we're like, oh, we need this money because it disproportionately um, pains the black population. Yet, we don't even know how to measure it, how to make it equitable. So we are going to be honest and sincere about the work that we have um, before us. And at least we're going to admit that we're not doing, like we're not there yet. And that's okay to do, even if it's hard. If it's whether you're white, black, or whomever you are, I'm gonna continue to say the same thing. Um, and that's what will set us apart from what's been done historically. That's what's gonna bring us out of systemic racism and create true transformative change, is when we're brave enough to be able to say, this is the status quo, this doesn't actually, this is not actually caring and loving and respecting um, the black and brown population. Um, and so I, I, uh, I'm sorry for uh, going on and on, but I felt the need to emphasize that. Um, and although I am multitasking and looking into your data, and even if, if I miss a detail or two, um, rest assured where the council will be investing and hoping to um, increase this um, amount, at least for me, I am strongly supportive of it. And um, look, I, I hope that my colleagues will agree. Do you guys have any other questions or comments um, before we close? We're good, okay. Um, then if, if you don't have any closing remarks, any statements or closing remarks before we go? Um. I think one thing I would just like to say, um, thank you to you, um, Counselor, and all the other counselors um, here today. Um, you know, we are all on the same page in terms of um, prioritizing um, investments in our young people um, here in the city of Boston. Um, I think I've sat in about five of these hearings, um, and you know, George and, and your team, your advocacy um, has been appreciated. Um, and you know, I would like to think that. Um, we have been, um, you know, just, um, you know, considerate of, you know, some of the um, measures that have come out of your advocacy and really try to have those conversations um, with the administration around ways to improve the work. Um, I think, you know, this is an ongoing effort to ensure that um, we are all being more intentional um, around ways in which we are serving young people, certainly through a youth jobs lens. Um, and it's something that, you know, um, that we're absolutely 100% um, committed to. So just want to appreciate um, all of you all for, you know, just, you know, um, just your voice. Um, because we, we talk about youth voice, um, you know, through our Mays Youth Council and our other civic work. We talk about the importance of elevating um, young people. And not only just elevating them, but listening to them. Um, making sure that their their ideas um, are brought to the table and we are responsive, you know, to their ideas, um, and that's what um, this is all about. Um, so our department, um, you know, we 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 love that, we appreciate that, um, and you know, we're, we're fans of it. So I just want to um, just say that and just say um, thank you. Thank you. I want to I want you to know for the record, you are the only department that the majority of uh, management is black. And throughout this entire process, you are the only department that is like that in the entire city of Boston so far. And I've looked through all of them. We literally are going through a study with BU to aggregate this data. And it's impressive. Obviously, it should be that way. It should reflect the population we serve. So I thank you for um, 
doing your job. I thank you, Chief Maso, and um, Um, <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy, how do you pronounce your last name? Kazan Jane Amory. Kazan Jane Amory? Yeah, Kazan Jane Amory, yeah. Where is that from? Uh, it's Armenian. It's Armenian? Half Armenian. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, well, I, I appreciate you all for your work. Um, please use us in whatever way that we can to support um, your work. Thank you so much. Meeting adjourned.